So before I start my talk, let me ask you some questions. First of all, who knows what Selenium is? Raise your hand. OK, I'm just checking you are on the right conference. Now, uh, who knows what Selenoid is? Raise your hand. 10 persons. Great. And who needs to run millions of Android tests? Raise your hand. Several persons. Let's move to the talk then. My name is Ivan Krutov, and today I'm going to talk about scalable Selenium clusters and how to run millions of Android tests with it. A few words about me. Being a software developer during the last decade, my main experience is related to Java and Golang programming languages. I also actively participate to open source projects. For example, I did a lot of contributions. I'm, a, I'm a, a, one of the core maintainers of the Selenoid project. My main activities during the last two years are called with a buzzword, DevOps. That means that I'm creating and maintaining various infrastructure. And one of the biggest products I'm working on is a big Selenium cluster. So how big is this cluster? Compared to a typical Selenium grid with 50 browsers and executing uh, 10,000 sessions per day, my cluster has more than 5,000 browsers running in parallel and executing more than 2 million sessions per day. This cluster is distributed across five data centers. The average load is about 4,000 requests per second. The traffic is about one gigabit per second. And this cluster is certainly working all the time. This cluster has all popular browsers and platforms, including last and versions of Firefox, Chrome, Opera, all versions of Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, Android emulators running on hardware servers, iOS simulators running on Mac minis, and for some teams, we also have real devices, phones, and tablet PCs connected to the same cluster. And today, I would like to talk in detail about Android. But why do we need native Android testing at all? For several reasons. First of all, according to statistics, more than half of the internet traffic today is the mobile traffic. Then, three quarters of mobile devices run on Android. Let's check this. Who has an Android device? Raise your hand. So uh, I'm seeing the majority persons. And finally, according to our experience, there are a lot of Android-specific bugs that cannot be reproduced even when using mobile emulation in desktop browsers. Having said that, I have bad news for you. Android automation is complicated. You may disagree, it should be simple. We take a computer, uh, add a USB hub with multiple ports and connect a respective number of desired device models. As usually, the devil is in the detail. First of all, there are a lot of Android device models with different Android version, uh, phones and tablets, uh, x86 and ARM, with different screen size, resolution, and pixel ratio, having hardware buttons and without them. This gives you a lot of combinations to cover by purchasing more and more devices, which is expensive. But buying a lot of devices is the beginning of the story. And uh, real devices require a lot of manual maintenance. They often discharge, lose Wi-Fi connection, uh, and log out from the Google account. From time to time, you will have to manually confirm software updates on every device. You will also have to buy a rack or a stand to store the devices and uh, a USB hub with sufficient charging power. And even doing everything correctly uh, doesn't prevent some of your devices from dying during your product release test run. So real devices are a nightmare. We need something similar to desktop automation, which scales well. And before we dive into the details, let me ask you who knows how Selenium works on the desktop. Raise your hand. Simon knows. So I think most of you uh, already know how a typical Selenium architecture looks like on the desktop. It consists of a Selenium server handling test commands, 
a browser installed in the operating system, and a web driver binary translating test commands to browser specific commands. Simple, right? Compared to desktop browsers, Android automation is slightly more complicated. You have to deal with a lot of components, including Android Debugging Bridge or just ADB, which is a command line tool using to uh, do the most common operations with real devices and emulators, like installing, starting, and stopping applications, copying files to the device and from the device, forwarding network ports, executing shell commands, debugging running applications, and many more. Android SDK also includes an Android emulator, which is a desktop application showing you just the same screen as the real device, and allowing to test mobile applications without real devices. When launching Android emulator, you can choose from a list of uh, ready-to-use configurations corresponding to real device models. But you can also create your own configuration with custom screen size, device pixel ratio, screen orientation, SD card size, and so on. Android emulator supports both x86 and ARM platforms. Internally, every emulator is a standalone virtual machine using KVM and Camo technologies. And Android Debugging Bridge is working exactly the same way with both, both real devices and Android emulators. Android automation is also based on Android instrumentation framework, which is a low-level Java API uh, allowing to subscribe to any events in the running uh, applications, such as opening the application, typing the uh, text in the fields, uh, clicking on the buttons, and so on. But contrarily, it also allows to send any events uh, to, the, to any of the application parts. Thus, you have full control of what's happening within the test of the application. The next Android automation component is called UI Automator. This is also a Java-based uh, library used for cross-application testing as well as testing the interaction between user and system apps. And UI Automator, when testing the application, sees this application like a black box. The last piece of Android puzzle is called Chrome Driver. Chrome Driver is a standalone binary using JSON-based Chrome debugging uh, protocol to send commands to browser. Uh, the same binary is used to automate both desktop and mobile versions of Chrome. And it's already distributed as a standalone web server compatible with, with Selenium uh, API. We now know all Android automation components and need a single Selenium compatible uh, web server using one of these components to, uh, depending on what the user requires. And such server exists and is called how? It's called Appium, certainly. So Appium is a powerful uh, web server implemented in Node.js uh, which is uh, introducing uh, its own protocol called Mobile JSON Wire Protocol, which is a superset of the web driver protocol adding uh, mobile specific operations such as tapping on the screen, rotating the device, locking the, the screen, and so on. And to support all these new commands, Appium uh, maintainers provide uh, client side libraries for different programming languages based on the original Selenium code. So there are a lot of ways to uh, shuffle uh, all of these components. And let me show you how a truly efficient combination can look like. So here is the video. The video. The game. So first of all, we start by installing a, a small server called Selenoid. We uh, do this on a server with latest uh, stable Ubuntu version and a recent Linux core 4.4. We have a recent Docker version installed on the server uh, and we don't have neither running containers nor images in the storage.
So uh, first of all, we go to GitHub and download a small standalone binary uh, called uh, CM, which stands for Configuration Manager. We go to releases page and can just copy the link to a uh, ready to use binary. So we copy the URL and download this binary to our server with a wget tool like this. So it's relatively small binary. It's about 10 megabytes in size. So we add execution permissions and execute only one small command to install all the Android automation stuff. CM, solenoid start, and we specify <coughs> Android version 6 as the browser desired. What it does, it downloads the latest solenoid release, first of all, and then it downloads a ready-to-use image with Android version 6 inside. So we take some minutes to complete. I accelerated a bit the video here. Then it configures the server and starts it. So after running just one command, we have a ready-to-use Selenium compatible server running on a standard Selenium port 4444 in Docker and some images already present in the storage. Now we can quickly install the user interface uh, by typing a similar command, cmcelenoid UI start. Could you turn on the light? So we type the command and uh, thank you. And now we have two containers running. The second one is running on the standard HTTP port 8080. And we have its image already present in the storage. So we can now go to the browser and open the user interface. All this installation takes, I would say, five minutes, depending on your internet connection speed. So we, we open the UI, and we are seeing Android, uh, Android present here in the list of available browsers and platforms. Now we can uh, launch our demo test. So here, this is a Java-based test using Maven for dependency manage management and standard Java Selenium client. Uh, what it does, first of all, it creates an Android version 6 session, opens a calculator, uh, built-in calculator application, and then types inside 2 plus 7 and checks that the result equals to 9. So very, very, very simple test. Here is the real speed, the, the real execution speed of this test without accelerating the video. Usually uh, the session, the, the, the new Android session, starts from scratch during 10, from 10 to 15 seconds. So you'll see right now. And the overall test takes about 25 seconds. So that's it, 24, even 24 seconds. Now we can see the screenshot of the calculator application and the correct result inside equals to nine. Next feature is the live Android screen. We can uh, place a breakpoint on the first uh, test uh, line and relaunch the same test. We need to wait again 10 seconds for a new session to be started. So let's wait, let's wait for this session. And we will now see in the UI a button showing this running session. So the session should now start. Please start. Okay. We can now go uh, to the UI and see this Android session. Uh, when we click on the button, we are seeing the real Android emulator working inside a Docker container. So if we resume the test execution, we are now seeing the Android test running in real time just in our browser. Okay. What we can do else, sorry. Uh, we can quickly switch Android versions by just changing the version capability in the test. And we can also quickly uh, switch the device orientation or device uh, skin by adding a new capability like this, so the skin. Here I'm specifying skin equals to WXGA800, 
which uh, corresponds to a tablet PC. So I will now uh, rerun the same test and you will see that we will have a, a pad device, a tablet PC, uh, by using just the same container. <clears throat> so as usually we are waiting 15 seconds for the session to appear. In fact, most of the time is spent waiting for Appium to do its magic inside. So we click on the button, and this time we are seeing a pet device, a landscape orientation. <clears throat> and we continue uh, the test execution and seeing just the same test working in the pet device. And the last thing I would like to show you is the video recording which is also working out of the box. We add one more capability call, uh, called enable video, and we can optionally specify the desired uh, video name. So for example, here we have seleniumconfindia.mp4. So I run the test, and uh, when it finishes, I will be able to see the, the, the overall, the overall, uh, the video of the overall test execution. This can help, uh, for example, for debugging some tricky test. Okay, so let's wait for the test to finish again. Okay, that's finished. And we can now open in browser a particular web page showing the list of available recorded video files. So it's available on the port, standard port 4444 slash video. Here is our uh, recorded video file. We can open it either in browser, but in this video I'm showing, I'm copying the URL and showing uh, this video file in the VLC player, for example. So here is the recorded video file for the emulator. Here is the emulator uh, being restored from the snapshot. It launches, then APM does some magic like, like uh, unlocking the screen. And now we will see the calculator application starting and just doing the same test. So interesting, right? Let's now dive into the details and see what's under the hood going step by step. If you remember, this talk is about running millions of Android tests. This is why trying to launch Android emulator on your workstation makes no sense. Usually you start playing with the new technologies on a clean virtual machine in your preferred cloud platform. So having a virtual machine, you download Android SDK, unpack it, create an Android virtual device, and launch an emulator. It starts, but is extremely slow. This is because default ARM uh, Android emulators are very, very, very slow. You spend hours digging the documentation and find that a, a, an x86 emulator can be quick when launched, can be fast when launched with enable a camo flag. So you add, add this flag and it fails to start. Why is that? If you remember, Android emulator is itself is a uh, standalone virtual machine. And KVM stands for a kernel-based uh, virtual machine. To run a virtual machine with KVM, your host uh, environment CPU should support a number of instructions. And this is what is usually missing in the standard, uh, standard virtual machines in the cloud. So you can run a fast Android emulator on a hardware server uh, supporting these instructions or on a particular type of a virtual machine uh, supporting nested virtualization. So on the next day, you take a hardware server and successfully launch an Android emulator. It works slightly faster, but a lot of applications like Google Chrome doesn't start it, crash on startup. And why is that? Because Android 3 and above require uh, GPU uh, 3D acceleration support to start these applications. And in order to fix this, we need to configure 
uh, 3D acceleration drivers, which are usually bundled within Android SDK. So launching an Android emulator was not, was not easy, right? But the rest should be simple. Uh, having a running Android emulator we, uh, and an ADB instance, we install Appium, launch our uh, first test, and it works. Great sense. So scaling the solution should be as easy as adding more emulators. For example, you start 10 emulators and you run the same test. But what's happening? Your tests are randomly freezing. This time, ADB is culpable. Uh, if you remember, uh, ADB was initially created as a debugging tool. So it's not so efficient when working with multiple Android emulators. How could we solve this? We need to somehow, uh, we need to, to, to use one Android, one ADB instance with only one Android emulator. And in order to have several Android emulators per host, we need to somehow isolate multiple running ADB instances. Who knows the most popular lightweight isolation engine today? Any ideas? Yes, Docker, point just the most popular one. So after installing Docker, you uh, create an image containing one uh, Andro Android emulator, an ADB instance, and an Appium instance. Having such image, you can now launch several identical uh, containers, roughly uh, one container per uh, CPU core. But your tests still require a single entry point proxying your request to the upstream Appium nodes. Who knows a good candidate for such position? Just a hub, just a Selenium hub. So just a Selenium hub. So with such architecture, you will now able to run uh, a lot of Android tests uh, without any freezes because uh, one ADB instance is now uh, working with exactly one Android emulator. That's it? Not, not really. If you leave such server uh, running the tests for a day or so, you will soon uh, run out of available emulators. Sometimes Appium disconnects from the hub, sometimes ADB or Android emulator processes go down. So in order for this architecture to remain alive, we need to somehow, so we need to, uh, somehow kick running uh, Docker containers with emulators. You can certainly uh, add a cron job periodically restarting the containers, but this can interrupt running, uh, running sessions. So it's better, it's safer to implement uh, a, an extension for Selenium Hub that uh, will be aware of running sessions and will restart only the containers in the idle state. And uh, such extension, the most common way to, to, to implement such extension uh, right now is to add a servlet-based extension to the hub. So what you are seeing right now is the first uh, possible architecture proven to work under the high load. It already provides good isolation between uh, emulate, emulators, Docker containers. All the issues with ADB freezes are now resolved, and the overall count of the emulators remains constant. But it, it's not ideal. Selenium Hub is known, uh, is known to consume a lot of memory and uh, become slow, uh, sometimes become slow even with dozens of connected nodes. Containers are always running in the operating system and thus consuming its resources. And uh, the most annoying, it's very difficult to start different Android environments uh, on the same host, different Android versions on the same host. Can we do better? Certainly, we need to have a Selenium uh, compatible uh, web server using the Docker API to start these containers. So when a new uh, session request arrives, a new container is uh, started. And when the test finishes, this container is removed, thus leaving your operating system in the same state as it was before launching the test. 
And as a year ago in Berlin, this simple feature uh, isn't still implemented in standard uh, Selenium server. So uh, welcome to the wonderful world of Selenoid, a uh, lightning fast Selenium uh, compatible implementation launching browsers and Android emulators within Docker containers. Who is already using Selenoid? Raise your hand. Several persons. Great, you are awesome. So uh, we now know how to create an image with Android emulator. But if you try to start to use this image with Selenoid, you will face a new issue. Android emulator starts very, very, very slowly. Just compare. A typical container with a desktop browser takes from five to 10 seconds to be ready. And the same, uh, a, a Docker container uh, with Android emulator on the same hardware takes from 30 to 40 seconds to start. So just the same amount of tests will run time slower just because of that. Can we fix this? And it would be great if we could start uh, Android emulator within several seconds. Yes, with the last releases of Android SDK, this is now possible. In December 2017, Google introduced a new feature called Android QuickBoot, which is very similar to uh, the hibernation feature in the desktop uh, computers. So here's how it works. First of all, you do a cold boot of an Android emulator, which takes as usually from 30 to 40 seconds. Then you stop this emulator and its memory snapshot is saved to the hard disk. Next time when you start an emulator, this memory snapshot is read from the disk and used to quickly restore the emulator state. And with this feature, Android emulator now starts during from five to 10 seconds. So we now have all the major, all the major Android issues resolved and let's now build a, an Android cluster from ready to use pieces. So first of all, we need uh, the images with Android emulators. We don't want you to spend your, to waste your time uh, creating your own images, so we provide a set of ready to use images for different Android uh, versions. Every image includes inside a headless X server an Android emulator configured to use exactly one Android version, an ADB instance, an Epium instance to be compatible with Selenium protocol, uh, optionally a Chrome driver to be used for mobile web testing, and a Android quick boot snapshot. So sometimes you will need to uh, create your own images with custom Appium version, custom Chrome driver version, or you would like to add your custom APKs uh, inside the image. So we also provide all the automation scripts used to build these images. So all this stuff is open source. So having uh, all these images uh, have a remarkable feature you have already seen. They, scan, they can be uh, run with any desired uh, Android device skin. So you, by just specifying an environment variable, you can quickly change the skins uh, using just the same image. And this allows you to use parameterized tests to quickly check that your application works well in different Android uh, versions and device models. So having such images, we can uh, start Selenoid on, for example, on a server. And uh, one server can, uh, depending on the hardware, can run up to 30 parallel uh, emulators. And what, what happens next? Everybody wants to use such server. And your Android uh, research server quickly becomes a production uh, installation used and release procedure of the multiple teams. So let's now quickly scale this uh, solution because your friends are just waiting here on Facebook. So let's, just, let's, let's finish this work. Uh, in order to have a readable cluster, a fault-tolerant cluster, your Android servers should be installed to two or more data centers. For example, we install in several units here in Bangalore. As usually, it fails. Just five seconds. 
I guess. That's a bug. That's a bug in LibreOffice. Okay. So you install several units uh, here in Bangalore, and uh, the rest, for example, will live in Mumbai. Now we take our extremely efficient load balancer called GGR uh, and install it to one uh, data center. So GGR has uh, its configuration files knowing all the Android hosts as well as data center information. Being a readable software, GGR can still fail if, uh, because of the network loss or the power outage in the data center. So we need to install the second instance. Both instances are distributing uh, Selenium requests across all Android servers. And uh, the last thing we need to do is uh, to deliver the single entry point to this cluster. If you remember, Selenium uh, is based on the HTTP protocol. So we can use the well-known uh, HTTP load balancing scheme, including two or more Nginx instances, for example, and a readable network load balancer. So a few words about the load balancer. Usually this load balancer is also distributed across multiple data centers, but has a single fixed IP address. So what you need to do, you need to just assign a domain name to this uh, load balancer IP address and use this domain name in your tests. So it sounds a bit complicated. Complicate. Complicated. Sorry. Sounds complicated, but let me quickly show you how easy it is to install such configuration. So here we have. So initially we have, for example, two virtual machines, uh, one in Mumbai and the second one in Bangalore. Uh, both have a recent Docker version installed, and as usually they are clean, so there are neither uh, running uh, Im containers nor images in the storage. And uh, what we are doing here, we just go to GitHub and we can take a ready-to-use configuration. So I just open sourced our configuration for the cluster. Uh, this is open sourced in form of the Docker Compose configuration. Who knows what Docker Compose is? Great, so everybody is using. Uh, here in Docker Compose file, we start two services. One is Nginx, and the second one is GGR running on non-standard HTTP port 5555. So we also have here an Nginx configuration file with the upstream section and the proxy pass, uh, the proxy pass using this upstream with the hosts. So it's randomly distributing requests across two or more servers. And in the grid router directory, we have a file with users, so user, the user test, and its encrypted password equals to a test password in this case. And we also have a quota file uh, for this user uh, having uh, all the information about the upstream hosts with Android emulators. And to install this stuff, we just clone the repository and uh, execute only one command. Who knows this command? No. Just docker compose up minus D, which stands for detached. And then docker compose does all the rest of the work. So it pulls all the containers, copies the configuration files, mounts the volumes, and so on. So in 15 seconds, we now have everything configured. We have two running containers, and Jinx on standard uh, Selenium HTTP port, and the upstream GGR, for example, on the port 5555. And now you install the network load balancer and uh, assign so here I'm showing also the images, the images, two images. Now you configure a network load balancer with a name, for example, like this, selenium example.com. You check that its port 
is configured correctly, it's open. So connection succeeded. And the only change you need to do in your tests in order to work with such cluster is you need to change the URL. So you just use the new domain name. You add the, the test user and test password. Some of you who are already working with South Labs, I think already know such notation. So that was it. You now see how complicated can be Android automation. Please use the right tools uh, to have Android automation working like a charm. Trust me, Android automation can be painless. And as usually at the end of my talk, some references. Here we have links to uh, GitHub uh, source code projects, our Twitter account, our Telegram support channel, our website uh, having links to various uh, Selenium related articles and my personal email. So thank you for your attention. You can now ask your questions. Is it on? Yeah. Hi. Uh, there are a lot of tools available in the market for on-red automation, like uh, commercial and open source. Sure, I don't Which get the, the question. main parameters should be considered for selecting the Android automation tool? <laughs> you think? I don't understand. <laughs> OK. So there are tools available in the market, like um, various tools for Android automation. OK. Just APM is there. Perfecto is there. C test is there. So in order to automate Android apps, which, which are the parameters to be considered while selecting the tool? Could you translate me the question? I just, I just don't get. Uh, why Appium? Uh, just because certainly we had an idea to implement everything because we, we prefer using, uh, for example, Golang to implement our tools. And as you know, Appium is implemented in JavaScript. And certainly we had an idea to rewrite everything in Golang because it would be faster and so on and so forth. But it's too much work. So we prefer uh, just uh, creating uh, stuff from ready to use components. And Appium is, first of all, Selenium compatible because that, that's our requirement to have a Selenium compatible stuff. We could, for example, use uh, Espresso, who knows, Espresso, there's Espresso framework, which it, what, uh, it's not compatible with Selenium protocol. So, and in fact, Appium is one of the most popular open source tools compatible with, with Selenium. So that's the answer. Uh, hi, my question, I have two questions. Uh, one is, um, uh, have, have you tried to implement uh, Jenny Motion uh, like virtual devices? Jenny Motion? Yeah. It's something com commercial, so far as I know. Uh, it, they have. They did have some free, uh, like they div They give you like free, couple uh, of free devices. No, because we prefer uh, the open source stuff, and we okay. prefer official. So we we, we take uh, regarding Android emulators, we take the Google official stuff. So ev everything uh, is just official. The, the reason why I ask that is because, um, at least in this part of the world, a uh, lot of users use uh, like Samsung devices, right? Mm -hmm. So those images are kind of like different from, um, they, they have a lot of wrappers and skins and a whole lot of another layer built on top of uh, the Google images. So the application is not exactly tested on the intended environment. So, yes, uh, uh, I so got the question. So that's where we, we get some disconnect. That depends. Uh, I think that that that's there is no clean uh, clean uh, how do I say uh, reply to this question because it depends on your application as usually. So you need to have your own statistics, uh, which bugs are reproducing on each platform. We can say just the similar stuff. Uh, for example, for there is Samsung browser stuff like this, but we are usually testing using the Chrome. So there are the differences. So this is all about uh, having your own uh, 
statistics, uh, statistics, bug statistics and uh, deciding whether you need to uh, cover this uh, patched platforms or, or not. So no, no, no clean uh, reply, I would say. But yes, this definitely helps. I mean, we can go uh, some way. Uh, thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Saurav. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, everything is open source so far, I have seen. Uh, yes. How you guys are making money? How? Yeah. How you guys are making money out of it? So because you, have co uh, you are doing competition with Browser Stack, Sauce Lab, and these people. And uh, most stuff is so amazing. Uh, I, I just want to know how you guys are making money. I would say that right now we, we, we don't uh, have any money for this, uh, this stuff, but we, have, we, cer we certainly understand that uh, in order to provide good quality, this should be uh, somehow uh, monetized. So uh, currently we have just a, a, a parallel uh, application for Kubernetes platform which is called Moon, and this is what is uh, commercial from the beginning. So Solenoid, uh, there is no, uh, how would I say, it will always, always be uh, open source, open source, uh, free, all the images will always be free, and our uh, idea is to create another product that will probably bring us some, some, some money. So this, this is all, uh, this all will, this product will always remain uh, open source. Thank you. You can see all the licenses are Apache 2, so really open source. All right, we got about time for one more question. No. Uh, are there any auto scaling capabilities available with this? So let's say we just have to create, uh, so in your example, you showed that you created two machines and you routed through, through them by an Nginx server, right? But uh, what if we wanted uh, an auto-scaling capability, let's say on an auto AWS? Auto-scaling? Auto auto-scaling capability auto -scaling. On, an EC, on an EC2 instance or something. Okay, just understanding the distinct words only. Um, so, Regarding the auto scaling, you mean uh, using the AWS and stuff like this? So far as I know, for example, in uh, Google Cloud, I don't know, I'm not a, an AWS user, but in, in Google Cloud, you have a virtual machines with nested virtualization support. So you can just configure uh, virtual machines like this. And they also provide the auto scaling. It's, it's called, uh, so far as I know, uh, scaling groups in Google Cloud. So some clouds already provide virtual machines with nested uh, virtualization. So far as I know, uh, Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure also provides uh, such virtual machines. And in, in, w, in AWS, you only have bare bone, I think, hardware servers only for the moment. So you can use such virtual machines also. But they are certainly uh, more slower than hardware servers. So it's possible, but you should check whether the speed is correct. All right. Uh, thank you, Ivan.